and uh, it's question time from our retreat group. So for those listening live, please enjoy. We can't take your questions, unfortunately, because this is a retreat, but hopefully you can learn something. So, ready? Actually, I think you should do the second. Yeah, maybe the first. Uh, uh, no, you do the first. I think I do the first and the second. Yeah. About Yoni So Manasi Kara, can you explain briefly or not what it is and how we can apply it to the practice? Is it possible to apply it to the calm mind when it is too wild? It's a calm mind, the calm mind when it is wild. Yoni So Manasi Kara is usually rendered as just attention, which is, well, it's actually work of the mind which is like focus on where you're supposed to be going. In other words, you don't think all over the place, but then you start to interpret, understand uh, what's going on. And, and that's basically what needs to be done. Well, I prefer Jonas and Manasikara as um, work of the mind, which is Manasikara. And Yoniso is a very interesting word because it comes from the idea of Yoni and woo. And I always try and kind of translate it or render it as work of the mind which goes to the source. It goes to the, the, the cause of things, the origin of things, and where it comes from. And this is actually seeing like the causality. That is what I prefer. And it's usually used to gain insight rather than to, think, to calm the mind. But nevertheless, when you have insight, you know it's good inside if it does create calm. So it can do. And related to that, what do you think about the wisdom developed samadhi approach? Is that present in the suttas? Of course it is, because it is the factor of the Satipatthana, the seventh factor of the Eightfold Path, that that is used to create the, the jhanas. So yes, wisdom develops samadhi, certainly. Okay. Do this or me do as well? Okay, here we go. Uh, apologies if this question is inappropriate. No question is inappropriate. And you may not wish to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will answer it. I have been a lifelong spiritual seeker and have tried most religions spiritualities, always coming back to the Dharma. I now consider myself a Buddhist. When I went on a Hindu retreat years ago, there was a session on opening the Kundalini. After that, when I meditated, I had a whole body orgasm, not sexual. Is this what you mean when you have said that meditation is better than sex? Or did you mean something entirely different? Many thanks, Ajahn Brahma, and then we channel this wonderful retreat. I was talking about something different, and that was just the bliss uh, in the mind, not in the body, when those nimittas and jhanas start to happen. It's a different flavor of joy and happiness. The kundalini, this is my interpretation of it, I always say that's really amazing energy, but it doesn't really belong in the body. It's much better if that uh, energy was actually in the mind. It will take you much deeper uh, in one's uh, spirituality. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just sometimes the Kundalini makes it a little bit more unpleasant later on in the body. All those people I've seen who I know maybe. Uh, they weren't doing it properly, who did the Kundalini practice. Sometimes their body was never really healthy or, or um, in good shape. Always left some um, residual sicknesses or, or hardness of the body. But anyway, those types of happiness which come in meditation, they certainly are much better than anything else you can experience. I can relax the whole body except for the eyes. There's usually some tension there 
I've tried softening it or ignoring it, but it stays. When the mind becomes more peaceful, the eyes start to flicker so much and it brings me out of focus. Any suggestions? Thank you. Hmm. Yes, where look, I can answer that too, is the nice thing to be able to do um, is to get some like, eye pads, eye shades. You put them over your eyes and then they will never flicker because you're not seeing anything. It's like you really are turning off your eyes and turning off the sight. So I would actually just try and get these um, eye shades. When I go on a flight, sometimes you ask for those if it's an overnight flight, and you just put them over your eyes and you can have a much better meditation. Okay. What are the skillful means of working with ill will? Remembering past small longs, irritation, and certainty of being right, I struggle with the metta practice. So the metta is obviously a wonderful way of overcoming ill will. And I was just remembering a little verse today during my meditation, actually, which inspired me from the Yaka Samyutta. It's the Mani Buddha Sutta. And the um, little Yaka comes to the Buddha and says, um, it's always good for the mindful one. The mindful one dwells in happiness. It's better each day for the mindful one. They are freed from enmity. And then the Buddha comes along and endorses some of that, but not all of it. And he says, it's always good for the mindful one. The mindful one dwells in happiness. Better each day for the mindful one that they are not free from enmity. And then the Buddha says um, something like, one who dwells in loving, how was it? One who dwells uh, relentlessly with loving kindness for all beings, um, seeks delight in harmlessness. For them, there's enmity with none, something like that. So loving kindness has to go along with the meditation practice and the mindfulness for it to really work. And then it helps to overcome all these hindrances. So simultaneously you're becoming aware, but also the metta along with it is an extra kind of power source. But if you're not able to practice metta straight away, I would suggest if you're remembering these things to try and actually do some intentional reflection on the things that you've done right in your life. So to actually use your mind um, skillfully to bring up beautiful aspects of your own mind, your own conduct, the, the qualities in your heart that you really value, for example, you know, you're remembering these things and you're recognizing that you don't want to have these things in your heart. So actually you really have this intention to become a beautiful person, more patient, you know, to um, try to develop love and kindness. So these are already strengths. So instead of looking at what's missing and what you've not developed, look at those intentions that you have to develop metta and to become more patient and less irritable, you know, and, and the honesty that you have as well. You say you have this certainty of being right, which we all have because we never think we're wrong, right? <laughs> so, you know, these are really beautiful qualities. So I would actually do that at the beginning of your meditation, like bring up your virtue. And this is called Chaganu Sati. It's one of the reflections that the Buddha recommends. And it's quite counterintuitive for most Westerners. We tend to really love to focus in on our faults and to kind of beat ourselves up for them. So it can be useful to go against the grain. So, and, and remember that metta practice is very powerful, not only in developing metta, but in showing you where you're blocked and showing you where you do have irritations and negativities. So it's okay to experience that. It's a sign of growth that you're aware of that. Do you consider any activities other than meditation worthwhile? I like spending time in nature, but that still is the playground of the senses. Please advise. Thank you. That was one thing which surprised me when we have in the books called the Theragata and Therigata. These were the poems of those monks and nuns who became enlightened. And they always were. I'm saying just how beautiful it is to spend time in nature. Like that kind of uh, surprised me because again, that is kind of the playground of the 
sentences or five sentences. But nevertheless, the thing about nature is you can't really control it. You see a sunset, or you know, you watch the animals, you see the birds play. And that seems to be always permitted uh, for monks and nuns and for any spiritual seekers. And I think the only difference between that and you know, the, the world which you know, does give you sensory pleasure is that you can enjoy the nature, but you cannot keep it, you cannot control it, and you enjoy it and then have to let it go. And you know, personally, you enjoy nature. And for many people on a retreat, sometimes you get much more peace when you just take a cup of tea or a glass of water or juice and you sit down there and just watch, as I call it, just watch the trees grow. Watching the trees grow, the trees do grow, but they're very slow at it. So it means you have a good excuse to sit there and do nothing for a long time and just enjoy nature. It's not really an activity, it's like a doing nothing practice, or just being passive practice, because you cannot control nature. And people find it very peaceful, and also a great introduction to the actual the silence of the meditation. Okay, yeah, so enjoying nature is okay. Mm. And can I add to that, that you ask about other activities as well, and I would say that service is a really important part of the practice, because if we only meditate, we can become a little bit too obsessed and invested in our own progress, and, and that becomes some kind of spiritual materialism, and we create a lot of tension around that. So I think serving as well, you know, being generous, and any activity whereby you can develop your virtue and your sense restraint. So really, it's kind of how you make use of these worldly activities rather than what you do, so long as obviously it's not breaking in any rules. So you can be really creative if you have a bit of fun and joy. Shall I do the next one? Yeah, go on. Uh, thank you, Ajahn Brahm and Venchanda. A welcome pause in life. Thank you to the amazing support team. Are you listening, support team? Amazing. <laughs> Two, freeing you both to give as you do. When I'm meditating, I'm either falling asleep or my mind is going a million miles an hour and irrational resentments are causing anxiety and tension headaches. I can understand this is a cause I'm creating with illusions, which then becomes more frustrating. Or do not understand, do not understand, or is it as simple as just letting things be as they're meant to be part of this journey? Hmm. So it seems to me that maybe you've been very busy before this retreat. This could be one of the causes and the mind needs to kind of, you know, just somehow find its balance again. So it's not quite sure what to do, whether to run or fall asleep. And it could be also that you're making a lot of effort and that's exhausting you. So you're kind of going really fast because there's too much energy and then you're falling asleep because you've exhausted yourself. That's possible. Um, uh, I understand this cause I'm creating with illusions, which then becomes more frustrating. I wonder if some nice meta meditation might be a good solution here, because that way you can kind of moderate the thoughts. You can have them at your own speed and your own time, and they can be soothing and quieting thoughts. This might be helpful to just replace some of the kind of speediness there. And it can also keep you quite engaged. But you have to find the right sort of objective method to practice it towards, because sometimes doing it towards ourselves, if we have a lot of resentment towards ourselves, doesn't really work. You know, we just get more frustrated because we're not able to do that either. So maybe just trying to like imagine yourself in a very nice, safe place and then with a good friend and sharing metta with that person, it could help. Um, do I not understand as simple as letting things be? And yeah, of course, you know, making peace with the situation is also important. And I don't know, would you recommend some kind of reflections or yeah, when some it's, other uplifting exercises? Yeah, when it's unpleasant, always remember this is where you learn the most. Mm -hmm. That's why the mosquitoes in Thailand, when I complained about them to an Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Chah just said, call them your teachers from now on, Ajahn Mosquito. And because they became my teachers, I couldn't swap them anymore. I couldn't sort of, how can you swap a teacher? How can you sort of get angry with a teacher? 
they taught you a lot of patience and a lot of other ways of dealing with problems of life instead of just trying to obliterate them. Mm. So anyway, it's wonderful you have gratitude to the CT to the fun of you here and the thanks to the people who make it possible for me to teach. And if I was you, I would be more concerned with the mind running around some class than with being sleepy. So I'm either falling asleep, fine, that's not a big problem. But thinking too much is more of a problem. And I say that because there's one of those stories from the Buddha when I often mention this. There was a monk on the edge of the forest who was sitting perfectly mm -hmm. in a perfect posture and the Buddha was worried about him. There was another monk in the center of the forest who was nodding you know, really finding it hard to keep a proper posture. And the Buddha smiled. And he said, I'm not worried about him. And soon that monk became enlightened. It's as if that when you are um, sloth and torpor or falling asleep, at least you're letting go. All you need is a little bit more energy. And then the letting go will become uh, clear for sloth and torpor. And you'll find a beautiful clear state of mind. The most difficult thing to, to heal or to overcome or to get past is a wandering mind. So get more sleepiness. Is it also possible if you have a wandering mind and the meditation is not working that rather than sit there and get more frustrated just do some chanting or something like that? Because sometimes there's that energy in the mind. Yeah. And it wants to engage with something. So maybe give it something more wholesome. But it does wear out. I mean, it, it can't last, you know. If you're on this retreat long enough, it probably will start to slow down. It's just a matter of patience, I think. Okay. The next one should I start. Dear Ajahn, what can I do if my peace and calm gets drowned by thoughts of being hurt and revenge? When it comes to revenge, there's this wonderful uh, statement which I made, which really many people loved, and they put it on T-shirts. Oh. And remember, I'm an Australian, okay? So this is the way they talk in Australia. Said, so no need to seek revenge, because karma will get the B-A-S-T-R-D-S -S anyway. <laughs> Did you get that? No need to seek for revenge because karma will get the bastards anyway. It's and a that, joke. It's a joke, yeah. But revenge makes no sense at all. You know, if somebody's done something bad to you or to anybody, the karma will sort it out. You can actually forgive it. And also being hurt, and that's, you know, you're afraid of being physically hurt. If you are very peaceful. It's very hard that anyone can hurt you. I've been in many situations in my life where I should have been punched, but they could not do it, simply because you had peace in your heart. On one occasion, the one I often talk about, I was organizing a big ceremony over in Australia, and the, the hire company, they delivered the wrong chairs. We were having the governor of Western Australia coming the next day with his wife and a couple of ambassadors or something. And then I was responsible for hiring the chairs and the marquees. And when they came, I told them we needed the best. Don't worry about the expense. And when they came, all the chairs for the VIPs, not one of them had their legs the same length. They all wobbled. And when I saw that, I quickly rang up the hire firm and got the manager just before they closed for the weekend. He said, look, we need those chairs changed. The chairs, you know, just these must be old ones because none of them can actually stand without wobbling. And so they managed to come back, managed to bring some more chairs. But when the truck came around the corner, the lorry came around the corner, 
who was still traveling at maybe 30 kilometers an hour. And one of the men jumped out because what had happened, all these men had already finished work the weekend. And the manager got into the, the office, which was the pub, and called all these men back to work. The Buddhists need new chairs. They weren't happy at all. And one of them jumped out and was so angry, he had his fist like this and said, where's the bloke in charge? I want the bloke in charge. So I walked out to him and said, I'm the bloke in charge. And this Aussie guy, big guy, you could smell the beer on his breath. That's actually the most beer I've ever imbibed in all my life as a monk. He had his fist in front of me, really angry. Well, because he knew how to meditate and be peaceful, he weren't being arrogant. He could not punch me at all. He was stuck there for a while. And all my friends and supporters, I remember this, they just looked. I mean, none, none of them helped me. Thank you, friends. <laughs> but they just waited. And because he could not punch me, because he had too much kindness, then soon the, the, the truck, the lorry parked, other men came out and said, let's help unload the cars, un unload the chairs. So that's what we did. I've noticed that very often. You know, when you have peace, not fear, not arrogance, no one can hurt you. Okay. I had a very blissful meditation with a stage flooded with light. Also I heard a very vague and distant sound as if chanting had started. Is this something to be expected? Felt energized and so blissful. Sadu, sadu, sadu. That was part of the question. <laughs> so yeah, I think this is something that can happen, that um, your sense of sound or the ear sense still starts to change. Sometimes you might hear things that sound even otherworldly. Sometimes sounds that are very close sound very far. Sometimes you might kind of have, I don't know, sounds like chanting, even if it hasn't started. But of course, it's not to be expected because it can always change. So it's not, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's also kind of unpredictable. It's not important, actually. But the important bit sounds to me as though it's blissful, it's peaceful. You're having lots of light and you felt energized. So that shows that mindfulness is really, really getting strong and the lights are turning up and you're kind of moving from the realm of physicality to the realm of the mind. So if it feels good and blissful and energizing, that's very wonderful. But uh, the, the challenge now is not to expect it again. <laughs> Anything else you want to say, Adam? Yeah, it is. You had a very, no, first of all, you had a stage fighter with light. That's an impetus. That's a beautiful thing which happens in meditation. And quite often, you don't just have visual impetus. Sometimes it's a sound impetus. And sometimes if you heard chanting, it'd be so beautiful. If it was just really almost unworldly chanting, that was also what happens at that stage of meditation. It's like a sound impetus rather than a visual impetus. For you, okay, why am I not progressing in my meditation from stillness and peace, Ajahn? Because you're impatient. You do progress. Mm -hmm. Just wait a bit longer and don't expect anything. When you don't expect anything, what I tell you, look, it's not going to happen at all. You just have to be happy with the peace and stillness. Then you find it happens. Taking away the expectations which cause impatience. Yeah. Okay. Patience is the highest quality, right? It Sometimes is. this is the thing. It's yeah. like it will happen, but it never happens according to our schedule. It happens yeah. according to some other schedule that we don't know about, which is very frustrating yeah. because it could be like That's tomorrow right. or next yeah. week. Indeed. But we're but not going to know. Always, <laughs> this has happened. I've taught so many retreats. People get the best meditation on the very last meditation when they give up. <laughs> so if not in life and death, in the yeah. time of death. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, they just give up. I've yeah. been meditating for nine days, haven't got anywhere. And so the last meditation, they're just killing time. And that's when it happens. But you are still in peace. Yeah. So it's already happened. Yeah. Okay. All right. Shall I do the next one? Okay. Just wanted to say it feels like this silent retreat reminds me of the Desert Fathers. 
in one of the books that I just read to a friend, as I read to him most weeks. That's a nice thing to do. Do the Desert Fathers practice in the silence with the same intention, please? So I don't know much about the Desert Fathers. I'm presuming that the Desert Fathers are from some sort of Christian or Jesuit tradition, is it? I'm not quite sure. And as far as I know, one book that I have read recently on my long retreat, I was recently in um, Perth, <laughs> as Ajahn has alluded to, and had a lot of beautiful solitude there. And one of the books I was reading was by someone called Anthony de Mello. And it's actually called A Way to God. And I am anything but interested in God. Really, I'm not. But it was very interesting to um, read this book because he had all kinds of uh, meditation tools and he himself seemed to really minimize the importance of God. And when he brought anything around God in, it was more as a kind of devotional practice to get in contact with love and with truth and with joy. And he was talking a lot about silence and about you know the importance of silence and being really present. And then even talking about experiences where he would be like closing his eyes, looking at this blank darkness in silence and then light starting to streak in and get stronger and stronger and getting into these really nice meditations that sounded very much like nimittas and jhanas. The difference is, as far as I can tell, and also the lack in the book, is that they are not necessarily aiming at the same goal. So I think a lot of the Christian tradition and maybe the Hindu and Sufi mystic traditions are aiming at some kind of union with God, which we Buddhists might call jhanas. Um, you know, we call it a kagata, which can mean one pointedness or one peak of mind, kind of union between oneself and these beautiful lights, the sense of love and joy and peace. So for us, that's not the end goal at all. The intention for me in my practice anyway is to, to understand, to understand suffering, the way out of suffering and, and the whole path to the end of suffering. So I think the intention is slightly different, but whether or not that matters in the beginning, I don't know. Ultimately, one needs right view to penetrate to the stream really. So there does need to be an appreciation of things like non-self, the non-self of the five khandhas that we've been discussing in the sutta classes, and also the workings of kamma and rebirth. So at least a provisional acceptance of things like rebirth, or a pre let's say a hypothesis, that you have it as a working hypothesis, and you don't take a stand to say it is definitely not the case before you've actually fully explored it. And that's paraphrasing the Buddha in one of the suttas. He says, we do not come to a definite stand that this is the truth without yet having had that experience of the truth. So I think we definitely keep an open mind and, and don't kind of come down on concepts like this is God or this is the goal, the final goal. But as Buddhists, we just keep exploring. There's something more that you've yet to understand. Unless you've really penetrated suffering fully, and the Buddha says that suffering pervades every aspect of experience and of existence. Unless you've understood that fully, then there's something more to do. Do you understand anything more about Desert Fathers? Yeah, it's one of the strange things about Christianity. They never had a, a tradition of monasticism. I wonders why there was a Desert Fathers in the face of the world in lower Egypt. And after a while, you do find that one of the main trade routes between India and the European settlement was you know, by boat uh, over through the Persian Gulf. The place of Aden was called the, the Asia Felicitatus or something. But anyway, that was, there's so That's many, at, okay. There was, uh, this was the town of Aden, it was a very ancient town. And in that town, the records you know, show that there were many um, Indians, Jewish people, and Europeans there. Basically, what we call these days the expats who were there for business. And from there, it, uh, the trade route went by boat to another town in Lower Egypt, which was built by uh, Philadelphia's Ptolemy. And there is, interestingly there, there are old gravestones with Damachakas on them. There was a large number of Indians even there. 
And this was, you know, from about two or 300 BC. And so because of that, the Indian influence on Lower Egypt was strong. And that was one of the reasons why I would suspect there was a tr tradition of desert fathers, which really weren't related to the Christian tradition, but which may have been related much more to the Buddhist tradition. Yeah. Just to say there's a lot of questions underneath. Okay, yeah. So, um, okay. Thank you, Venerables, for bringing up the importance of kindness to others and to the so-called self. Wonderful retreat, much gratitude. P.S. Please, could you speak louder? Yes. <laughs> we will. Okay. Is wisdom the application of the Dhamma or right view in the present moment with right mindfulness? Is this wisdom also conditioned and there's no will making the right decision or view? So no new karma made in the case of an arrow hat or unwholesome karma in the case of an unenlightened being. So in the, so end, in the end, one would have to let go of this wisdom too, as if conditioned it's impermanent. <laughs> Hope this makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think wisdom is a little bit more simple than that. But um, certainly right view and right intention are the two aspects of the path which are directly related to wisdom. So the first two factors of the path. And as I was saying earlier, I think it's good to have, you need to have at least, even as a non-stream winner, a provisional understanding of right view. So at least to understand things like karma, to understand that there are effects of your actions and that that matters. And that karma is also um, based on intention so there are wholesome and unwholesome intentions and to learn to differentiate between the two and to have some kind of understanding that there's uh, no self in here, at least as a provisional working hypothesis. And also the right intention is really important, learning to relate to everything with kindness, with a sense of non-ownership. I like to think of that as the renunciation, like non-possession, non-control, non-ownership. Um, an ability to let go, and also um, the gentleness, the compassion, if you like. Um, and the wisdom is conditioned. The Buddha said, you know, that uh, Kalyanamitta is the whole of the holy life. So one needs wise companions, even noble companions. And if you don't know who's noble, then you know that the Buddha was. If you have a little inkling, a little smidging of faith, then you can take, you know, the Buddha as your teacher. And um, the Buddha said that one with uh, wise companionship is bound to develop the Eightfold Path. So in a way, that's not the will doing it, but it's the program that's been put in by the areas. Um, anything else there? No. Is that enough? Okay. So yes, I mean, in the end, once the wisdom's done its job, of course, in Parinibbana, there's no nothing. So there's no wisdom either, in a sense, but this is a long way ahead. And in the meantime, I think we just need to practice the whole path. Okay. Is it a case of the more we meditate, the better results we get? It's just not the time, the amount of time you meditate, but it's also the quality, the wisdom and the kindness which you put into it. But of course, when you meditate long, and it's good meditation in the sense of you know, all those qualities are there, of course you'll get better results. Ajahn and Venerable, I find it challenging not to be judgmental of those around my age who use parts of the Dhamma to justify elements of their lifestyles that aren't always wholesome. I'm in my mid-thirties. I try to put his metta on myself and, and to them to help, but it's not always working and the judgment still arises. Can you give me further advice and tips? With gratitude to you all for making this retreat possible. Wonderful. Yeah, so it's natural to be judgmental so long as we're not uh, enlightened. And I often think of judgment as the opposite of compassion because we're judging a person, um, which means we don't really understand why they are the way they are and that they perhaps can't help being the way they are. Maybe they just haven't heard the teachings that you've heard. You know, they haven't got the same amount of wisdom and understanding as you do right now. Um, and I think it, it, in a way, Part of that judgment is also wisdom, right? I mean, there's something called discernment that is able to differentiate between dhamma that's used to actually further oneself on the path and dhamma, so-called. 
to justify things that aren't really wholesome. So it's good that you have that ability to discern. The bit that needs work on is where you start to suffer due to that. And I would suggest perhaps just trying to understand where they're coming from, but also that the more you practice on the path, the more important it is to start associating with people that do have a similar understanding to you so that you can consolidate and build on yours. And you don't have to be around people that simply aren't going in the same direction. I mean, before then, and if some of these people are your friends, you can also just gently talk to them about what works for you without trying to change them, but just to inspire them, you know, tell them the things that you've learned about from your own practice and the way this, that it's changed you. And you never know that might help with them as well. Um, and lastly, not to judge yourself for judging others, because like I say, it's part of life. Um, and, you know, it's not a terrible judgment. I mean, you're actually annoyed with things that are unwholesome here. So that's better than being annoyed with things that are wholesome. <laughs> so give yourself a little bit of a break. And, um, yeah, just keep on associating with people who, um, who you really relate to and resonate with and who can help you to understand things better as well. Is that enough? Yeah, good. Great. So next question. Yeah. What we discussed today in the Sutta class left me feeling rather gloomy <laughs> as there is so much suffering and one seems having to work very hard despite the old attention demanding body in order to do good karma, to finally stop creating oceans of tears, streams of blood and mountains of bones. <laughs> The way you say it. You mentioned a, sorry, it's gloomy. You mentioned that craving for existence is one of the greatest defilements. What about craving for non-existing existence? That's also a, a great defilement. Because the more you crave for non-existence, the more you have existence. So how to overcome that as existence seems to be constant stress. One of the we were talking about this Ayachandra and I afterwards. And we said one of the reasons why we try not to make this too gloomy is to laugh and crack jokes with you. And he said, now these are two people practicing this path. How can they be so happy and so joyful and smiling all the time when this is supposed to be gloomy? What actually happens, it may seem gloomy to you, but there's also the reason realization this is actually true there's one of the monks over in thailand had this wonderful statue with this person putting their hands up in total bliss <laughs> and saying joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world and that was just a beautiful little statement joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world what does that mean? It means that once you understand this truth, there's a great sense of relief. But this is true, this is real. And once you realize what the problem is, the solution becomes quite uh, clear also. And once you see the solution, then there's a wonderful sense that you can know the path to freedom and also help other people walk that path to freedom. That's where the joy comes. Mm. Uh, yeah, can I add something to that? that um, for me, understanding suffering also was, um, it gave rise to a lot of compassion for others because when you understand suffering and you realize it's universal, it's not you that's suffering like unnecessarily or because you've done something wrong, it's just normal. And just as you feel, other people feel too. We all go through very similar sorts of crises and stages of, relative joy relative desperation it's universal and there's nothing wrong with that in fact the buddha said we can understand that and then become free from it and so i think learning to then respond in a way that attempts to bring more happiness into your own and other people's lives in other words the practice of compassion is a natural outcome and something very very beautiful because when you really do have that tenderness of heart that everybody you meet could be going through something that you really can't conceive of 
then you just want to do good and you take every opportunity you can to practice virtue in an active way. So again, this virtue is not just abstaining from stuff that makes you suffer, it's acting in ways that promotes the happiness and well-being of others. And it, then it becomes extremely fun because that kind of happiness is wholesome and you can sense that that kind of happiness is um, diminishing suffering and actually creating more joy for you in your life joy that you can rely on and joy that is not to be feared. Thanks. Yeah. You do that? Okay. Uh, Often strong pain and tension. Okay. It's my advice so I should actually justify myself. <laughs> I feel strong pain and tension along my neck and shoulders. I tried your advice as that and blah, but it doesn't work yet. What can I do? It's sometimes this strong pain and tension along your neck and shoulders. Have there been any injuries there? You know, sometimes even see if there's a doctor can help you there with lessening the pain. Or sometimes you can try doing laying down meditation or walking meditation. I know some people, they just could not do the sitting down meditation. When you talk, taught them how to do the walking meditation, they really got into it. It made it much easier because in walking meditation, you're actually moving the body. And that little bit of exercise just allows a little bit of healing to happen. So if uh, you get strong pain and tension along your neck and shoulders when you're sitting meditation, try another type of posture, you know, even the laying down posture or the walking posture, mm -hmm. and they might fix it. Good. Yeah. Actually, I had a friend in Perth who had the same, and he started doing a lot of walking meditation and was relieved. Anyway. A passage concerning samsara, the passage concerning samsara is, samsara is sobering. A first point is not discerned. The Buddha speaks with certainty. If a beginning isn't found, how did he know he, he could stop looking? <laughs> he saw this definitely somehow. The magnitude of suffering implied by this is almost incomprehensible. And I think that's the point, that it is incomprehensible because there is no real i'm not sure a first point is not discerned i think the old translation was there's no discernible beginning but i guess it's the same thing yeah it just means that he looked back as far as and and didn't come to that point yeah, so i don't know 91 eons of existence. 91 eons it's pretty scary but yeah, i think the eons. idea is that delusion is the cause of creation right the delusion is why we're all here and so delusion is there and until wisdom arises, delusion cannot really end. Yes, I think there's also the case that you can see just how this the universe cycles work. Mm. You, know, you can see just you know, the underlying cause and effects of this. You realize that it does go on and on and on and on and on and on. And it is not really scary, but it is sobering. It wakes you up. So the importance of making sure that this is your last birth, or you know, you're putting an end to the cycle of rebirth. Mm. Then maybe the important thing is to have that confidence that um, coming yeah. in contact with the Buddha's teachings actually puts a kind of chip in the program. Is that right? Yeah. And it actually does start the process going in a different direction. Yes, the first point is not disturbed. But an ending point is concerned. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same, really. I sometimes feel overwhelmed by the amount of suffering that there is, not only in myself, but, you know, all around. And then I just have to fall back on sadha, on faith. You know, the fact that how rare can it be to come into contact with the Buddha's teachings? It's certainly incredible, incredible good fortune, you know, and that there are beings alive today who have experienced an end of suffering. Beings not very far away, maybe. <laughs> not myself, <laughs> yet. <laughs> but we're well on the way, you know. Like anybody, I mean, we as in the group, anybody who's heard the Buddha's teachings already has, like, all those elements of the path, at least in the preliminary phase, 
So it's only a matter of time, I think, once you've heard these teachings and once you are kind of freaked out by the amount of suffering that you have and that could still be there for you, it's just inevitable that you're going to start practicing. And, you know, even for people who stop practicing or think they're not progressing, I just don't believe it. I think, you know, in my experience with serving a lot of retreats and you know, just seeing thousands of people go through retreats, sometimes people stop for 10 years, but they always come back to it. They just have to because you can't forget these teachings. You know, what else do you want but to end suffering? Can you do that? I can read it if you like. Okay. To save it. No, I am going through a medical situation. Sometimes when I start to meditate, pain shows up. I'm trying to understand how to be kind to the present moment. Should I care for a part of my body that is sick? Yes. Should I open the door of my heart to pain? You can open the door of your heart to the pain, but open the door of your mouth to the medicines. Most people take medicines, even enlightened monks and nuns take medicines. It just helps to be kind to your body by doing something that even the, the doctors would advise. Meta example phrases would be appreciated since this is very difficult for me. Even to understand how to do it, I can see how desire to be healthy again can lead to suffering. Brilliant. But at the same time, it is what drives me forward when I go to doctors or try different treatments. It only feels natural. Correct. Wouldn't accepting pain or not hoping to, to heal only lead to not taking care of it? Correct. Please comment. Again, I'm so grateful for your teachings. Yes, you know, you'd look after the, you uh, do whatever is possible to lessen the pain if that's at all uh, feasible. But then sometimes, no matter what medicines you take, what treatments you take, sometimes it comes to a point where you still feel discomfort or pain. And that is where the wisdom from the meditation uh, can come and stand out. You can find other ways, much more than the doctors can do. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, go and see those doctors and take their um, advice. It's just that you've got another string to your bow, the meditation and the wisdom, which can sometimes be even more powerful than what the doctors do. You don't accept the pain if you can change it. It's only if there's nothing else you can do, then you can accept the pain. Just on the part about the meta phrases, because we did a guide of meta today, and I only gave probably one or two examples of some phrases. But as I said, you know, make them very personal. So here you're saying, should I open the door of my heart to pain? So you could actually use that as a phrase, like, may I open the door of my heart to this pain? This is a meta phrase, right? And you just gently say that to yourself, but not with any kind of pressure. Just as a kind of, may I doesn't mean open your heart, you know, it just means it gives the mind a suggestion, a kind of um, encouragement in a way to do that. And then the other one you were saying is, um, should I care for the part of my body that is sick? So you could say, may I care for this sick part of my body or may this suffering cease and ease? May I learn to look after myself with kindness? You know, any of these kind of phrases can be helpful just to sit with that for a while and say them to yourself in a way that's really soothing and that calms the mind. And then, as I said, you know, don't just focus on the words, focus on the meaning and then listen to the resonance of those words in your heart because they do have an impact. You know, the mind, the brain understands it and it, it brings some kind of comfort and warmth that you can experience directly in your body. So you might experience that as a kind of... Um, tingling sensation around the chest or the heart or just a gradual relaxation and that can also help but again it's not that you have to use those to make the pain go away you know see if you can get some care from the doctor as well okay okay i am a t1 diabetic would i be protected if i fell into deep meditation from low blood sugar thank you both for your teachings i'm astonished at my good karma to be here <laughs> I think if you mean that you are T1 diabetic and you fell into a deep meditation where you do suffer from low blood sugar, what would happen when you came out of that deep meditation? 
and all the things which I have seen and even witnessed and experienced in these deep meditations, it's incredible just how the body looks after itself and actually just heals many, many diseases and afflictions when you are in that deep meditation. Remember, in that deep meditation, you just have the mind and the five senses in your body are just distant from you. It's like your body has disappeared. When the body disappears, it can sometimes be fantastic just how uh, diseases can, can disappear. It can sort of um, vanish. You're not quite sure why, but that problem is not there anymore. And, but certainly it means that when you are in those deep meditations, that you are um, invulnerable, even from low blood sugar. I'll read that out and then do that one. Okay. So that's not really a question. Uh, my tears of joy nurture these seeds of Dhamma. Thank you, Arjun Brown, for your engaging explanation of the five hindrances, confirming samsaric home truths. It brought up my clear memory of seeing my dear mother when she passed peacefully at home with her kind daughter by her side. She definitely found the inner peace I think we've been talking about today. She looked to me like an empty vessel, but her energy is all around. It's so lovely, isn't it? Also, thank Venerable Chando for guiding us in a beautiful meta meditation. We're so blessed to have you back, Saad. Thank you very much. Also, I feel blessed to be back with such wonderful Kalyanamitas. <laughs> That's very beautiful. So the next question, is there a problem in engaging too much with devotional practices? Can one have too much sadha? So I think not, if it's the right kind of sadha. It depends towards whom one has sadha, towards what one has sadha, but if it's towards somebody like a Buddha, um, somebody you have really a lot of confidence in as a teacher that you've really checked out and I don't mean just anybody because that can lead to kind of problems right if we follow the wrong people and we take uh, refuge in them as a being rather than in their qualities but um, I think you can have as much sadha as you need and especially in the west we tend to have a lot of wisdom and critical faculties so it can be probably quite good to develop that indriya and the buddha says time and again i mean it's the first of the five indriyas so it leads to the rest and it empowers the rest but also it can lead to confidence confidence leads to joy and this starts what is called the natural process from suffering to confidence right we hear about suffering, we hear the Dhamma, we know that we suffer, and then we get confidence in the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha. And the Buddha says that this leads naturally, without any effort on our part, to joy arising, pamoja. And from that joy arising, we get rapture in the body, tranquility in the body and mind. And then that leads to sukha, deep contentment and happiness, which is more and more subtle and refined. And then this is the prerequisite. This is the proximate cause to deep meditation. So actually the path starts off with that confidence. And if there's a lack of confidence, uh, that is more of a problem to the path. It will create problems later on. And sometimes I think the practice can get a bit dry without that devotion. So I have quite a lot of sadha and it gets me through things that I wouldn't be able to get through with wisdom alone that I can tell you for sure sometimes it bridge, it's almost like it bridges the gap you know between what you kind of intuit but what you've not yet to reach and then you just have that confidence that you can take that extra step you can keep going especially when you see people or even acts which really inspire you so yeah that's what I would say would you yeah, agree good yeah okay Next question. Thank you both for the teaching. During practice, during the practice today, a lot of anger and craving arose. The more I looked for calm and the more anger got worse. That's usually quite common because when you try to get rid of the anger and craving, again, you get angry at being angry. You crave to not have craving. That's why you're feeding it and it gets worse. At a certain point, I asked to understand asked them to understand it's much better. What are the causes for these things? Faces appeared to me. I did matter, now it's better. But it was <laughs> a busy day. How to stay inside the pain and dissolve it? It's not just staying inside of it, also give it the, the kindness. In other words, you're not trying to dissolve it. 
to open the door of your heart to it, allowing it to be, treating it with um, softness. And you're not trying to dissolve it, it dissolves by itself, but you're not trying. And, and count these small progresses, right? It was a busy day, so you're tired, but actually you made progress, really good progress. Yeah, well done. Okay, this is not so easy, but I'll try and be brief on it because we've got a lot of questions and we might have to, I don't know how many more there are, but um, I don't know, are we okay to go a bit over? No, I'm try okay, and finish yeah. them? Okay, so um, I'll be brief. Is there a reason for samsara? I mean, why would there be a process with suffering baked in and a long struggle to escape from <laughs> it? Why not just have no beings and no suffering to start with? Ah, wouldn't that be good? That's what we're trying to teach yeah. them to do. Yeah, yeah, because that's the end result. <laughs> but the real reason for it is delusion, because it is delusory to want suffering and to kind of, you know, be part of a process that perpetuates suffering. It's only delusion that could possibly create something like that. And that's why the Buddha says there's no discernible beginning, because delusion is the cause. So here we're trying to um, overcome delusion through wisdom. Wisdom is the um, opposite of delusion. Delusion is avidya, like... Um, yeah, delusion, I think, is the best translation. Sometimes it's called ignorance, but it's kind of misappropriating what we see to be something that it's not. And then vidya is like seeing things correctly according to the real reality. So seeing things that are impermanent as impermanent, seeing things that are non-self as non-self, seeing suffering as suffering, and what's beautiful is beautiful, ugly is ugly. So this is what we're trying to do, and that's why we need to overcome the five hindrances, because the five hindrances are that which nourish delusion. So even though there's not a cause for delusion, there is a nourishment for it. And the more that we um, uh, have these five hindrances and indulge in these five hindrances, um, and the more that they grow, the more they feed delusion. So it's there that we can start to starve delusion of its food. So yeah, too late, I'm afraid, like you're in it. So <laughs> make it a short struggle and don't struggle. <laughs> a few years ago, my meta meditation used to be very pleasant. I would feel a lot of heat around my heart area. The smile would come up by itself. I used to feel the strong energy. Nowadays, I don't feel much at all. I faced a major suffering in the meantime, and I wonder if that's what made me not as good a person. I'd be probably really a good person, but as I used to be. Any advice, please? Thank you so much. Of course, the major suffering just took away a lot of your energy, a lot of your power, and but the major suffering doesn't last. But when it goes away, that those uh, practices and attitudes which created and cause such good loving kindness meditation before will come back again. A lot of times the mind doesn't forget these things, it's just a little pause because things got a bit difficult for you. So it will come back again. So don't worry. Be happy. Yeah. Yeah, it's just cause and effect. So it will come back. Okay. I think you used to come to my group as well, so Let's start that up again. Yeah. It's the regular <laughs> practice, not because I want to flag yeah. my, flog my group, but just yeah. um, it's the regularity, you know, and it's practicing with others as well. It's very helpful, especially when you have suffering. You need that help holding environment. It's much more healing than trying to heal by yourself. Okay, this is an interesting one. Dear Ajahn and Venerable, I'm just curious. Could the number of sentient beings in the world be finite? It might be. And if so... There will come a time when no Buddha will arise again in the world. Mm. That's an interesting one, because if yeah. people leave the world, yes, but otherwise having a lovely in. time here with much metta and gratitude to all. But where do they come from then? Because, I mean, oh. beings in all the Lokas, do they yeah. not just kind of keep changing places? No, they don't just keep changing places. It's a couple of suttas where it says things like plant life is just, it's a, uh, an initial form of this sentient being process. And from there it can grow and develop into uh, 
sentient beings as we know them. So there is uh, a way in as well as a way out. Super. It seems we're going to finish then. There's one, two more. Okay. Yay. Is yoga one aspect of your life as monks and nuns? Do you practice yoga as a way to meditate through the training of the body? So it's not necessarily an aspect. It's very personal and individual. I mean, it doesn't um, conflict with the practice. So I think many people do practice yoga. I practice a lot of yoga, actually, until I came to Perth in 2012. Yeah. I practiced every day. <laughs> I don't know what happened after that, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I do but I found it. having wrecked my back by mixing concrete. Oh, yeah. It was, you know, the uh, cobra. cobra posture yeah. done over six months, which really healed it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really helpful, not necessarily to train the body. Yes, it can help the body, but also, I mean, the way it's taught in the yoga tradition is a kind of preliminary form of mindfulness. And the whole point of yoga, when it's really the proper Ashtanga yoga, not the thing that's called Ashtanga yoga, but the actual eight limbs of yoga, includes something called Yama and Niyama, which are basically the to-dos and not-to-dos. They're the moral code. So they do have that. And then the ultimate aim of yoga is... Um, do they call it Gnana or something? It's like G-Y, or that might be. Anyway, it's Samadhi, basically. Chitta Vritti, something Naroda, is like the aim, basically stilling the mind. And they call that the aim, the end goal of yoga. So again, it's this jhanas, but obviously not the Sama Samadhi of the Buddha because they don't include necessarily the right view. So yeah, I mean, it, it's a good thing to do, I would say. Uh, okay, you want to finish? Okay, with this? going deeper into our Buddhist practice means spending a lot of time turning inwards, which means turning away from participation in the world. I feel it is important to be a citizen of the world and learning about the issues that plague our world and taking action where we can. I feel I should participate in, let's say, political action to help remedy social injustices. Do you recommend staying away from such things and not reading the news because the world as it appears is all illusion? I remember I participated in the world. I remember giving a lecture about dementia. Uh, and this was uh, in, I think, Singapore, one of the hospitals in Singapore. And I, when people said, what is dementia? Uh, the experts, the professors said, well, dementia is where you uh, obviously uh, don't concern yourself with the past and don't plan for the future, you become socially disengaged. And when I got up on the stage in front of my partner, I said, oh my goodness, that's what I teach people to do in the monastery. Do not concern yourself with the past, no worry about the future, be socially disengaged. And so I'm teaching how to be demented. <laughs> There's a bit of truth to that. But this is actually um, consciously being able to let go of the past. And it feels very peaceful that way. To be socially disengaged doesn't mean totally disengaged. And of course, you see, like monks and nuns, we do do a lot. Some people say too much. But nevertheless, we do feel it's important to be very care careful, especially in politics. I've seen many, many people who have been very good politicians when they start, but the whole process of politics can sometimes uh, take away that goodness and that kindness. And is that the best way to change situations? Sometimes we have grassroots concerns, which don't go invo involved in politics, but just show what's possible by having a, a few small group of people living in a way uh, which challenges others. Even monasteries can be like that, where we live incredibly simple. And we, you know, we don't have big buildings or great expenses. Live in small houses. All those sorts of things can actually teach people there's another way to live. And that type of um, uh, that type of social action as many people visit monasteries, can be very influential. Yeah. Can I just add that I think when you are, 
you're making a choice to be a lay person. So of course, there's a certain responsibility that you have and it's not really right practice to just turn away from suffering where you can do something about it. But I think, you know, it's always really important to try not to burn out because sometimes we can just, you know, go so kind of full on to try and help others and to try and save the planet, which is impossible anyway, that, um, that it leaves us in a state of exhaustion and burnout. So it's a good thing to do so long as it's done to moderation, you know, whereby it's still beneficial to yourself and others and it can actually become part of your path. So it should be feeding the meditation and actually giving you joy so far as possible. So now we are over time and yeah. Ajahn's past his bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> as maybe I am too. So <laughs> thank you for your wonderful questions you so and your wonderful practice and you're all doing fantastically well and look there's a real cat there Ajahn looks at oh. your cat every time you have your picture oh, yeah. on there oh, like, oh look oh that's a real character look at that yeah <laughs> and it's monastic color as well <laughs> very nice thank you so good night everybody and we'll see you tomorrow morning at eight o'clock sad is sad is sad is sad please don't do anything I wouldn't do <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.